Hello and welcome to Inside Healthcare. We have a great program for you. As you can see, we are not allowing the coronavirus to stop us from bringing you the very latest in healthcare news. We're talking with experts about how you can personally address the biggest public health threats today, the COVID-19 pandemic and racial injustice. We begin with the American Medical Association calling racism a driver of health inequality that puts populations in arm's way and leading to premature illness and death. The death of George Floyd has shocked Minnesota and America and sparked a seismic shift in the American consciousness around this public health issue with tens of thousands of people protesting here in Minnesota and in the United States and around the world calling for making this a moment for real change. We ask our first guest, retired Minnesota State Patrol officer who is passionate about this and what each and every one of us can do to help bring about this real change. Can you begin by telling us what you do and why you're passionate about it and how does that fit into today's discussion? I'm a Woodbury community member. Been here since uh, around 1990. Uh, for most of the time I've been here, I was uh, employed by the Minnesota State Patrol. Uh, and part of that time was uh, working with diversity, recruitment, community outreach, and those kinds of things. And uh, I retired from there, and I have another job at the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, training and auditing, not associated with what I was doing before. So it kind of gives me a wider experience base. And at my age, I can look at that as maybe they can, I can be wise, maybe not. And I understand that some of your work, especially when you were at the State Patrol, involved um, diversity training and inclusiveness. How did you get started on that? What was that involved with and why did you do it? Well, I retired the first time from the State Patrol in 2001 when I turned 50. I went to work for a private company and then was asked to come back specifically to work on community outreach and diversity recruiting. Uh, the State Patrol was at that time and still is struggling to get young or men and women, not just young ones, uh, who are not white male. And uh, it's a kind of an uphill battle. Uh, that was what my job was to do, go out in the colleges, uh, go into the neighborhoods and try to convince young men and women of color that this would be a viable uh, and good vocation to pick up and they could contribute back to their community by their experience, their life experiences as a state police officer uh, in dealing with members of the community that they serve. And what did you enjoy about doing that and why, why do it? Uh, it was the right thing to do. Uh, when I got on the state patrol, I was the third African-American ever hired, uh, fourth, excuse me. There was one that got hired in 1957 of all things. And he was at his retirement time when I started in 1977. Uh, two members came on in 1976. Uh, and then I came on in 1977. Uh, there were also a couple of native uh, men who came on, one native woman. And it was about that time that we got the first women to come on. And that issue with getting persons who are not white male to have an to additionally have interest in the state patrol was very important to do and uh, i viewed myself every day working as a, a representative to show uh, that it's a good job and you ac actually can make a difference in the community and you know what the 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 death of um, or murder of george um Floyd, that um, this has raised a lot of issues and questions. Men American Medical Association says that um, racial injustice is a major health risk to our um, public health. And, and how does, how people are going, you know, it's raised that awareness and people want to do something and there's the peaceful demonstrations, but what can we be doing to address this issue and, and really truly make a change? Well, I think that, um People have to listen, not be afraid to listen to others who are explaining their, their condition, their plight, uh, their perception of where they are on this planet, and that their expression of their anxiety, their expression of the frustration, their expression of the pain is real to them. And folks who want to get involved in this have to have a sense of empathy that the person 
to whom they are listening, not just hearing, they're listening, is speaking what they really feel. And then the listener has to acknowledge that and then maybe assist and ask for me questions to get a better depth of understanding. Once you understand that, then maybe start doing some action items to alleviate the problem or try to contribute to change the mindset of those who don't think there is an issue where the issue is brought upon by themselves. That's what I'm hearing, that people didn't think there was an issue, and now all of a sudden they realize maybe there is an issue, all populations, people of all well, colors. And You know, if, if you come to work, I, I live in the suburbs, a second-tier suburb, and I come and I have, you know, I was thinking about this last night, uh, I think there's four or five grocery stores that are like a three-mile radius from my home. Um, when my wife was working for the Salvation Army as a social worker, the clientele she had didn't have any grocery stores other than the dollar store and the convenience store and no car to drive to the supermarket. They had to take public transportation. Dells are all things that uh, you, they get their stuff done, but it's much more difficult than I am in a suburb where I have, I'm privileged. Uh, and I had, don't have to deal with those kinds of things. Those prices that are jacked up in a convenience store for the milk or the, or the uh, sustenance things you have to get at a grocery store. I mean, the issues that we're talking about are so massive and complex, but, and how can an individual, someone watching the interview right now, what can they do to try to make a change? It, open your heart and say, I need to find out more about this so that if I'm inclined to be assisting with it or supporting uh, the change, I need to understand what the change is about. So you have to not just uh, listen to your favorite MSNBC or Fox News where you, you hear a lot of biased uh, information, but do some research on your own. The internet's a good thing. You hit Google, like, a, like Googling racism and health crisis and see what kind of articles pop up, papers written by college professors and uh, learned persons in sociology and psychology who can talk about those things. Enlighten yourself, find out more about it. Just like you would if you're gonna take up a hobby. You learn a little bit about something and then uh, the more you know, the more questions you can ask and more questions you can ask and your experience base and become more grows, you become more fluent in that topic. And the more fluent you become, the more you are able to interact and find out what do I need to do how do I do it? And to what degree do, can I participate? What degree do I feel comfortable in participating? And that is one of the most important things to understand. Jumping into this and interacting with persons different from yourself is not comfortable because you're opening yourself to listen about things you, that may make you feel bad or might make you feel angry, but you have to listen. The uncomfortable talk has to occur. It's not going to happen. So you feel like people need to do more than just peaceful protesting and taking to the streets to get their voice and to make a change? Um, I have uh, an acquaintance who has been posting in support of uh, the African-American community. He's a white guy with a couple of college kids, older, older, young, older children. They're just at college or out of college. Uh, and we sang in the same choir. He's been posting things in his way, supporting Black Lives Matter or, you know, remove the knee from the neck, uh, inclusion in his posts. Now, he has a whole circle of friends different than I have. We have to be friends. Other people are seeing that. This afternoon, they're marching uh, at the Black Lives Matter march. It's going to start at Ojibwe Bay Park and just a circle around the high school and come back. Uh, their, the kids already he already posted his kids with their signs that they're going to use when they're marching. Uh, that is a friend of mine who's doing he's understanding what he needs to understand and he's dipping his toes in the water uh, to be supportive and work for this inclusion and this, and try to be part of the change. That's a good example of I think a way to start. Uh, and there are those that I do know that are still well that's not my problem and that's that's okay too. We'll chip away at those persons kindly and hope that they can see what they can contribute as well. 
you know, you talk about it being a health crisis. And uh, when I first heard that association, I'm going, I didn't know what I didn't know what, what it really meant. It's a health crisis. And then I think for me, it's like the coronavirus, COVID-19. It's a pandemic. It's a health crisis. And in a health crisis, a lot of things are mobilized to address the issue, to find the causative factors, to determine how to mitigate the bad stuff, try to figure out how to keep it from happening and not from spreading. But all these resources from everywhere are called in to bear on this particular issue. So for me, it's uh, racism or those issues as a health crisis means that where we try to involve everybody in finding the solution. This catalytic event has happened a number of times uh, before the one that happened two weeks ago with, with George Floyd. Each one of those started something and it stalled out with resistance uh, from the establishment and from folks who says, don't rock my boat, I like the, the way it happens to be. So now we'll see if this becomes a tipping point that can have a sustained drive toward a, a positive resolution for everyone. Now joining us is Rob Anderson with the Urgency Room. Thank you for joining us and glad to have you back with us. And um, we're talking about COVID-19, about um, where we are, what's the latest with it, what the testing that you're doing. So um, what, what is going on with um, COVID-19 and the Urgency Room? Yeah, well, thanks, Jody. Thanks for having me back again. It's nice to be able to chat and be in a room by ourselves so we can not wear a mask and actually have a conversation. Um, but yeah, we continue to test a lot at the urgency room. Um, our volumes of people coming in and our volumes of testing subsequently has gone up as well. Um, on average, the state is averaging perhaps around 10% positive results. At the urgency room, we're seeing that we're actually seeing maybe around 12% positive results. And I think um, what we've seen looking back at our data is that more families are coming in and wanting all the family members to be tested. So then typically close household contacts are going to be positive as well. Um, so that's why our numbers are, I think, are a little bit higher than what the state has. And uh, last month when we talked with you, you were saying who should be coming in to be tested? Is that still the case? Have you revised things or changed things up since then? Yeah, so we continue to test anybody with symptoms. So anybody who has a fever, cough, shortness of breath, chest pain, um, chills, lack of smell or lack of taste, we started to see a kind of an uptick in that and people coming in saying, well, I just can't taste anything. That's my only symptom. I wonder if I have it. And sure enough, we do the test and it comes back positive. So uh, we continue to test symptomatic individuals um, with all of the uh, protests that occurred at the end of May and the beginning of June, the governor's office in Minnesota Department of Health did recommend that anybody who participated in those protests to, be, to come in to get tested as well, five to seven days after they were involved in something, um, just because we know with the close contacts that people had during those times that there is a chance that they may have acquired uh, COVID-19. So that's been a newer recommendation. Um, they have recommended some asymptomatic testing as well. Certainly healthcare workers who have a significant exposure, we'd like to test. Um, so we do have the ability to do that um, as well. And to clarify too, the testing that we're doing is testing to see if you actively have COVID-19 disease. There's another test that's out there, the serology test that helps to determine if you have been exposed to it, if you had COVID-19 in the past, and that test, you have to have had at least 14 days pass from when you completed the illness to when you do that test to determine if you have the antibodies for it. And that test we're not doing at the urgency room. Um, we're just doing the test to determine if you definitively have it or not. What are you recommending? Tylenol, things like that, to mm -hmm. if they have um, a fever? And... Yeah, so the most important thing is, you know, controlling the fever. Oftentimes when we have a high fever, we'll feel worse, we'll get a little bit of a headache, maybe some body aches. Tylenol does help with that. Um, ibuprofen traditionally does help with symptoms like that, but there have been some anecdotal studies questioning if ibuprofen may have a harmful effect on people who have COVID-19 disease. So we're not recommending ibuprofen outright. Um, we recommend sticking more with the Tylenol. You know, staying hydrated, your normal, um, 
things that you do for the common cold, but knowing that COVID-19 disease can become more serious. So if somebody starts to develop significant shortness of breath, if they walk up a flight of stairs, they feel like headed, dizzy, they can't catch their breath, they get some chest pain, then absolutely they need to come in and be evaluated for that. We have the ability at all three of our sites to um, look at somebody's pulse oximetry or their oxygen level in their blood. And that's really what helps determine um, the severity of the illness of COVID-19 disease. Um, those are devices you can get and monitor at home as well. Um, but certainly if anybody is sick and not feeling very well, we, we highly recommend coming in to be seen. And with other conditions as well, we have seen that people are avoiding um, seeking medical help um, because they're worried about contracting COVID-19 disease. At our sites, across the metro, at all the hospitals and clinics, everyone is doing everything possible to keep them as safe as possible. Um, so those numbers are starting to change. We're starting to realize um, people in the community are starting to realize that they are safe environments. They're coming back out for their normal illnesses. And we just want to continue to um, encourage that process. And, and we're doing everything possible to keep them safe when they come in. Any final comments? Yeah, just enjoy the summer. It's warm weather now. So do a social distance walk with your friends and, you know, talk to other people. It's, it's been a long journey that we've all been in with COVID-19. It's not easy um, to continue the, the isolation and as restri restrictions um, loosen a little bit, um, be mindful of those. Um, again, it is a real disease that we um, do see, but, um, you know, we also understand where everyone's coming from and we need to be able to see other people and talk to other people. So with the warmer weather, go out for a social distance walk and, and still see um, you know, friends and family in that manner. So joining us now is Ruth Helgram with the Artist Senior Living Center. So thank you for being with us and but hope you're doing well. Doing well, thank you very much for having me today. We know that COVID-19 has amplified social isol isolation for seniors and then even more so I would think for seniors that may have dementia or um, other con health concerns and stuff. So what are the risks that happens? What, how do you recognize it? What are some of the things that for caregivers as well as, especially those with um, dements dementia challenges? You bet. So yeah, these are times of a lot of stress for everyone and then, when you compound that with the stress of caring for a loved one who's experiencing dementia or Alzheimer's or any health consideration really, it just makes it that much more of a, a, a challenge for the caregiver. It also impacts the person who has um, dementia or Alzheimer's. Because number one, you're not getting outside as much. So you don't have the outside activities. People are wearing masks. That's concerning. Um, not that there's anything wrong with it, but to someone who's got cognitive um, decline, it can be uh, why. And you can answer the question a number of times, but if they have no uh, short-term memory, you'll be answering that for quite a while and it'll still concern them every single time. There's changes to their routine. There's um, fear around the pandemic and even around the unrest that we're having right now. Um, and there's just so many fewer people to interact with. So those are some of the things that create that sense of, you know, um, unease. So what does stress look like for a dementia patient? That's a, a really good question. Um, you know, s some people, depending on where they are on the journey, they may um, just experience it from uh, a greater sense of agitation, just unrest that um, you know that something's not right with them. They, they seem different. Um, there may be some increased confusion. Um, they may be asking a lot of questions. They may be bored because there's not as much activity going on. There can be a deep sadness and depression beyond that which they normally may have when they're in a, um, you know, in dementia. Behavior issues that can be um, a problem. Uh, things just get manifested that way, and it's hard to understand what those causes are, so that you can bring them in. 
Um, and then just a faster than usual decline in the disease. A lot of people that I've talked with recently have said, you know, um, my mom, my dad have really, um, they've really suffered a lot and it seems like they're going down much faster than they did pre-COVID. Well, I, I, I just can't imagine what they're going through. What about for the caregivers then? And I would think it's extra stress on that on the caregiver as well. Absolutely. We don't want to underestimate that stress because your caregivers are doing so much heavy lifting already. Um, always putting the person who has the dementia, their needs um, first, and then if there's any time in the day taking care of themselves, um, it can be a, a lot faster to burnout, to caregiver burnout, when you have no one helping. Um, there are a few people coming in the home, perhaps. Um, other family members are afraid to bring in any um, illness into your vulnerable loved ones. So there you are, um, people delivering groceries to you. You're never getting out. Um, it can feel like you're caged in, um, like you can be helpless and hopeless. Um, you might have a shorter temper than you normally would have. Um, we are all very resilient normally, but when things are, when you're that impacted, it's that fight or flight. Um, you can really lash out, you can say hurtful things, and it's not your fault, it's just the situation. So go easy on yourself and, uh, and forgive yourself for those things. This is such a tough time. So how can you um, manage those things for both the caregiver and for the dementia patient? There are some really great ways to turn down the, the heat on this time period. One is turn off the TV and turn on good stuff, but turn off the news really. Keep it to just a couple of minutes in the morning, in the afternoon. And if you can, do it by yourself. Um, the news isn't helpful to people with cognitive decline. It can be very confusing. They don't know that that's not happening right outside the door. Um, so their sense of time and place can be very interrupted. And seeing all of that on television with the unrest and then with the COVID, um, it can just be very, very confusing. So I would say turn on good music, turn on good movies, turn on their favorite things. Um, and if they like to watch Wheel of Fortune or Jeopardy or um, Family Feud and they want to watch it forever, let them watch it. It's giving them some mental stimulation. The other thing is if you can get outside, um, do it safely, but do it maybe once or twice a day. Short trips outside, get into nature. It can calm people down. It's good for your endorphins. It's also um, good to get some of that extra energy out. So we recommend that. Um, start some helpful new routines. If your loved one happens to be really um, in you know, maybe the earlier stages of the journey of dementia, maybe they can be a part of some of the things that you um, that you're doing to take care of the home. And so some chores, a chore list, it helps people feel like they're contributing to the greater good. And even if they're not really good at it, you can praise them for it and go back and fix it later. But to that sense of well-being, of self-efficacy and self-esteem is worth a million dollars. Seems like all great advice for all of us. <laughs> Yeah, it really is. It's across the board. It is. So if someone wants more information, what would be some resources that they can turn to for more information? Okay. Well, our senior living, we are opening to new residents starting June 29th. So that's a very exciting uh, turn of events for us. And we have... Um, some wonderful webinars that are coming up. We do educational free webinars. One is on the 10th and it is Veterans uh, Benefits 101. And the next one is Jul or June 24th. And that one is about powers of attorney worth their weight in gold. So a couple of really good educational webinars for, for people to take advantage of. Reach out to us, we're at 493-2840. Uh, 
So now joining us is Keith Parker from the Great River Greening. Glad to have you with us coming from my backyard here. We've been trying to meet and I'm so glad that we're finally able to do this. COVID-19 has kind of interfered with some of our plans. So Keith, glad to have you with us. So um, uh, first of all, tell us just a little bit about Great River Greening and, and um, how COVID-19 has interfered with some of the, your plans for the summer. Yeah, thank you, Jody. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, get on the air with you. And, you know, congratulations on all the great work you've been doing with this program. Um, I know we were visiting earlier and uh, we met each other years ago and you've been doing this program for about 15 years. So appreciate the opportunity to be on with you, um, you know, this morning. Thank you so much. Uh, great River Greening, uh, we've been serving the community, restoring land uh, in wonder for 25 years. Uh, we do land restoration. Uh, we do eco uh, system enhancement. We started back in 1995 as a program of the St. Paul Foundation, and we were primarily restoring the shoreline on the Mississippi River in kind of the downtown St. Paul corridor area. And uh, we were doing that with volunteers, as I mentioned, again, through the St. Paul Foundation. It was their program and their philanthropy uh, that really got us started. Uh, we were so successful bringing volunteers to bear and doing restoration on a part of the river that was very industrial and beautifying it, um, that we were spun off into a nonprofit. And so 25 years later, Great River Greening continues to restore land and wonder, and we use volunteers to do that work uh, independently of you know, the program that the St. Paul Foundation started 25 years ago. And COVID-19 has kind of um, interfered with some of your plans for this summer. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, thank you. It has, just like it has for everyone. And, you know, Great River Greening is impacted because, as I mentioned, you know, uh, we use upwards to 2,000 volunteers a year to get out on the land uh, and plant, you know, uh, trees and do pollinator habitat and shoreline erosion work. And, you know, uh, those volunteers aren't available uh, because we have stay-at-home orders and everyone is practicing uh, safe social distancing as they should. Uh, and so uh, that's where we have seen the impact. We can't get as much work done because we just don't have as many hands and many hands makes for light work. Uh, and so we're still getting out there uh, with smaller uh, amounts of staff. And we have just started this past week to explore whether or not we can do smaller uh, events while still practicing safe social distancing. And we think that we can do that. You know, the benefit about nature is that it's pretty expansive. So you can get out on, you know, 10 acres, 40 acres, two or more acres with a, a small group of people and do plantings but still be socially distanced. And in fact, you know, Jody, you uh, have a health program here. And, you know, uh, as you probably are aware, um, part of, you know, good health, mental health and physical health, physical health is the uh, connection we have with nature. And so uh, during this pandemic and, you know, the unfortunate civil unrest that we're experiencing, uh, we really think that it's therapeutic and good for people to still uh, get respite from nature uh, and get outside. And so we're able to still do that incrementally uh, in smaller groups. I'm, uh, as I've mentioned before, I mean, I'm so impressed by some, when I've seen the transformation before and after pictures, it's just amazing some of the work that volunteers and that the Great River Greening has been able to accomplish and accomplish already in these 25 years. Just amazing. Maybe highlight one of those other projects that um, you're very proud of. Yeah, I mean, there's so many, you know, I feel like who am I going to leave out because <laughs> I'm proud of all of them. Uh, but really love the work that we've done along the Mississippi River. Uh, we're doing some work along the Rum river uh, up in the northern part of the state. Uh, we work with Minnehaha Creek Watershed District as well. Um, and that really is the essence of what makes us successful is the collaboration we have with cities, um, local counties and municipalities and community members. And so a good example of that would be uh, in Dakota County, Lebanon Hills Regional Park. We've worked with Dakota County quite a bit to do restoration out there. It's one of those areas where it's so expansive that you can have a hundred people out there and you may not see all of those people in any yeah, given day because it's big enough. Uh, and so really proud of the work that we're doing out there and so many other uh, areas in the Twin Cities uh, and, you know, the state uh, that it's really too numerous uh, to mention. But I'm proud of all the work uh, that our staff does and that the community at large does 
uh, in collaborating to restore nature. Thank you.